one thing that has come up over and over again is capacity building. And the Appalachian Regional Commission has put uh, capacity building for, first and foremost to make sure that, you know, that we can lift communities up uh, to be able to access the, the billions of dollars of federal funds and, uh, and, and really starting at the, at the grassroots. And so thank you for your leadership on that, you and your entire, your entire ARC team uh, working tirelessly on this. Um, on that theme of technical assistance and capacity building, um, we're going to have a, a, our next panel on this, uh, and I'm welcoming uh, Rachel Young from the Just Transition Fund and, and the JTF. Uh, we'll hear uh, about their federal uh, federal uh, funding assistance there. Uh, Kate, uh, Gra uh, sorry, Grace Blanchard from from NACO, the National Association of Counties, um, and I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about Breck. Uh, I hope so. And, uh, and Ruthie Caldwell from Vision Granted uh, to talk about uh, how we can uh, continue to push forward on capacity building and technical assistance. I hear a thing. So I'll hand it over to you. I'll do it and I'll go to here. Oh. Well, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to follow Ms. Manchin this afternoon. On behalf of the National Association of Counties, I'm Grace Blanchard, and I have the pleasure of sharing more about our Building Resilient Economies and Coal Communities initiative with you all today. Many of you all are likely familiar with the National Association of Counties, NACO, but if you're not, we serve the 3,069 counties across the U.S. We advocate for county priorities and federal policy making, um, share best practices for county leaders, and create networks to enhance local leadership. At NACO, I'm charged with leading our Building Resilient Economies and Coal Communities Initiative. We like to call it BREC. Um, and BREC is a community of practice that is supported by the U.S. Economic Development Administration. The purpose of BREC is to empower local governments and provide community leaders in coal communities with the strategic tools to revitalize their communities and strengthen the future of their economies. So we use peer learning strategies to help coal communities identify those projects that are going to help their community um, and transition into that next new phase of economic development. So I'm gonna quickly highlight BREC's activities um, that are supporting communities in this middle space that we like to refer to as technical assistance and capacity building. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Ruthie Caldwell of Kentucky, who's gonna speak to how Floyd County leveraged BREC and other TA programs at the local level. So if we go to the next slide, if you guys don't mind helping me, I appreciate it. Thanks. So BREC is made out of four key components. The first is our BREC National Network, which is open to all coal community stakeholders. The second is our Commitment Coalition. This is 20 local government leaders committed to deepening their knowledge of economic resilience in coal communities and sharing those best practices at home. The third is our Action Challenge. This is where 15 coal communities applied and received specialized coaching support to create an economic diversification strategy. And the fourth is our National Storytelling Campaign, where we aim to share local experiences with a national audience. So if you look at the next slide, I'm really grateful that BREC is not just NACO. We collaborate with the West Virginia Community Development Hub, Community Builders based in Colorado, and Entreworks Consulting, and Eric Pages with Entreworks is here with us today. All these folks are experts in providing the type of capacity building support that a lot of coal communities need. To begin though, I want to expand a little bit more about our national network, so the next slide. This is open to all coal community stakeholders, local governments, regional organizations, um, educational institutions, um, and our goal is to connect and create an active support network for, res um, for sharing resources at a national scale. So me being here, this is your invitation to join the BREC National Network. If you haven't already, here's what you're gonna get from it. The first is strategies and solutions. Um, we're going to share frameworks and guidance on how your community can build a more resilient economy. Second, we're looking to learn from each other. There's no need to create the wheel, recreate the wheel. We're looking to feature those success stories at the local level. Um, what are the coal impacted communities doing in the Rocky Mountain West? What are they doing in Appalachia and how can we learn from each other? 
The third, what are the resources? <laughs> Events like this remind me that there are so many, but which ones are right for your community and how do you connect them to those specific project ideas that you have um, at home? So you can join the Breck National Network by visiting our website, um, naco.org backslash, bre backslash Breck, and this is where you can find case studies and plans, and you can also have the chance to register for our bi-monthly webinars. Um, the next thing I want to make sure you know about is our Commitment Coalition. So this is 20 local leaders from coal communities that are committed to identifying those economic development projects and resources and discovering those um, approaches that can be replicated in other energy communities. So by traveling to four distinct coal communities, this group of 20 is building relationships and learning from coal communities across the U.S. Um, and they've traveled to Southwest Virginia, Lincoln County, Wyoming, Moffat County, Colorado, and there we've uncovered how communities are pursuing economic diversification, seeing projects for outdoor tourism, value-added agriculture, entrepreneurship, or even coal to nuclear transitions. And I want to quickly recognize Sharon Fain with Pacific Core Power and Rocky Mountain Power, as well as Carla Vita with the state of Minnesota, who are here and represent two of our BREC coalition members, and they're great resources. The third component of BREC is our action challenge. And this is where I get to turn things over to Ruthie Caldwell to share more about BREC's capacity building in Eastern Kentucky. Awesome, thank you so much, Grace. I feel very honored to get to be here. So I'm a project manager and a grant writer, and I call myself a bureaucracy navigator based in Eastern Kentucky. And I mainly help small businesses, new nonprofits, and local governments try to navigate the system of grants and apply for and you know plan their projects and things. And this is one of the first projects where I've gotten to work in my own community, so I'm so excited to get to share this with you all. Um, and I have been able to to access so many of the resources that the interagency working group has been able to provide. So what I'm hoping to share today is a little bit about our community in Floyd County and the timeline of the BREC program and all the other resources we've been able to benefit from from the interagency working group because of it that I hope all the communities in here can also benefit from. So um, let me paint a picture first of Floyd County. So I live on a hilltop where there's a big family who's been there since the 1700s, and they've just absolutely embraced us, adopted us. Our kids get to play outside together. During the pandemic, there is nowhere I'd rather be. I have four kids, and they love their school. They're doing really well. They feel safe there. Um, I have springs on my hilltop. There's a creek we can go fishing in. Like, it is paradise, right? And I know that there's so many communities here that also you feel like you live in paradise and you don't want to have to leave and you need opportunities. And so we have to build the capacity of our local governments and organizations to be able to do that. So thank you for this interagency working group and trying to make it where we can have communities where we can stay where we are. So, um, oh, perfect, thank you. Next slide. Or maybe I can do it myself. Okay, there we go. So. Painting a picture of Floyd County, um, it's a small county in eastern Kentucky in the Appalachian Mountains, so about 35,000 people. It's absolutely beautiful. Tourism is a huge asset we have there, um, amazing water, and just, um, just it's so beautiful, but there's also a lot of distress. It has the most historic coal camps that have closed than any other county in eastern Kentucky, so Floyd County's been dealing with this issue for a long time of losing jobs and trying to figure out what do we do next. And we are also right in the middle of all the red you see in Appalachia for the distressed counties, meaning we're like on the bottom 10% for economic development, right? So we've got a lot of issues. We've lost a lot of coal jobs, especially since 2008. Um, but we also have so many assets. I mean, you think about all the opportunities we have for tourism, and we have this amazing workforce. We have the Country Music Highway. There's amazing musicians and artists that come from there. We have to lift up these assets, right? Um, one thing that I am really proud of with Floyd County is our civic engagement. If you look at that map, there is a big thing of white in eastern Kentucky, and that basically means low economic well-being. You'll see this little piece of blue, and that's Floyd County, and we have high civic engagement. So I'm super proud of that, and that means we have lots of hope. Oh, wrong way. Would you go forward? Thank you. Okay. 
So things all got started with the Central Appalachian flood a couple of years ago. It was really rough. There were about 13 counties in Eastern Kentucky. Floyd County was one of them. We weren't even hit as hard as most of the others. It was a really, really rough time. Um, so there were, I think, 44 people who died. Um, there was a lot of businesses that were lost. It, it's been really, really hard. But the wonderful thing, the only silver lining, is that it brought people together. We were helping our neighbors, and we were having nonprofits get together who had never really worked together before, right? And so when that happened, we realized we don't want to miss out on this opportunity of working together. So we decided to apply for the BREC program. Next, next slide. OK, next slide. So here's our timeline. So the disaster happened, and then we put together a long-term recovery group. And all these organizations said, let's, let's apply, because we were missing out on all these federal opportunities. There was a bunch of different grants that were coming down, and we just we had our hair on fire, like Donna Gramble was saying, and we just didn't know how we were going to get the plans together to apply for these. So we missed out on lots of FEMA grants and things because we didn't have the plans. And so we realized we needed the plans, and this Building Resilient Economies and Coal Communities program was a perfect way for us to get our group together and start making those plans. So we spent about a year doing that and making an economic diversification plan, and now we were able to get awarded from the Department of Energy the building capacity for repurposing energy assets that Deborah spoke about earlier. And it has been so helpful. I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, and then we got our Achieve. So we're on the fourth stage right now. Achieve is easy, right? Um, next slide. Thank you. So this was the BREC process. So basically, we got all the groups together, and we applied. And then the West Virginia Hub was our coach, and they were amazing. And they helped us like assess our assets and start thinking about what are all of our different opportunities. And they had this great template for this diversification plan. So they helped us with that. Then we started engaging lots of different community members, and we were able to come up with ideas of like what priorities do we want to have for our future, and then coming up with project ideas for that. Um, and then we drafted it, and this whole process took about a year, and then we got to present it uh, in D.C. in front of federal funders, and it was so great to be able to network with other peers and be able to make connections there. Next slide. So these are some of our team members, and that was really one of the strengths of BREC, is getting together people we hadn't normally thought of getting together. And I can't thank Mountain Association enough. They provided a lot of support for um, some of their staff members to help us with plans and things. And we had SOAR there as well. So a lot of the folks here today, and then West Virginia Hub was an amazing coach. Next slide. And so we came together with this economic diversification plan. And so we decided we really needed to focus on housing and infrastructure, especially after the flood, local business development, and workforce development. I'm going to go into a couple of projects. Um, so next slide. Oh, wait. First, the feedback on Breck. This is what they asked me to do. OK. Um, so having lots of partners at the table, this was so important, getting to have the peer networking and everything. I loved that. It was really helpful. The coaches were amazing. Um, Getting help writing was so important at the end because you had all these volunteers, right? And so having someone actually put it all together was like really important for the plan. Things that I think could improve, um, it would be great if people had team leads so that we knew like, okay, these people are really going to be investing their time and that they were expecting to be able to do that. Um, also, it would be great to have a little more in person, like maybe having a peer networking meeting at the very beginning to kick things off so that people could get to know each other. Um, and then having at least one in person for the, uh, the coach coming and helping, because actually we were able to get a donation to get some travel paid for, and that helped us so much to have them come in person. So please put that in future grants uh, to have people in person for the helping with the plans. Okay, next one. Yay, the impacts. Okay, next slide. Um, the Just Transition Fund, Rachel Young is going to introduce that in a minute. They have been so helpful for us. There's been lots of projects, so I highly encourage you. If you're having trouble, you just find that you're stuck with a certain project, reach out to them. They can help you, you know, look for funding maybe, maybe find a grant writer, connect you with all those things that you need to get your project moving forward. And then next one. Okay, so then because of BREC, we had this network and um, RMI, I think Jeremy's here, he mentioned at one of the BREC meetings that there is this opportunity to apply for. We never would have heard of it if it hadn't been for BREC. So we applied for it, and we got it, and this has really helped fund the next stage of planning. So next slide. OK, so some of the outcomes of getting that uh, repurposing existing energy assets one is that we were able to increase staff capacity. Um, so one thing is the Appalachian Regional Commission's local government ready, local ready government. Yep. 
<laughs> okay. Oh, no, the, the local government one. There was a ready program for local governments as well. Um, but yes, Floyd County got both of those. And that's been super helpful. Um, and then also we're gonna get an American Connection Corps person, which is like an AmeriCorps person, um, and they're gonna help move forward some of these projects with the planning. We're super excited about that. And then the next is, we had an organization called the Place Initiative come out, and what they do is, uh, I think they're based in Portland, but they serve nationally, is they help communities who are trying to prepare for incoming what they call climate migrants. People who are moving away from places that maybe have wildfires and droughts and things like that, or wanting to come out to the country where there's water and beauty. Floyd County is perfect, right? So trying to make our community more welcoming for that. So we've been working with Place Initiative. They did a pre-community assessment for that. That was really helpful. And Just Transition Fund helped them come out. Thank you for that. Um, we've also been working on a coal asset map. So basically, we, had, we hired a local man who knows, oh my goodness, so much about the, the geology and everything of our local community. And we drove around to all these different assets and they've developed this, this map of like each one, what are the assets on there? Does it have water? What, what would it be good for? And he, he was so perfect because he was like, oh, well, this one would be good for agriculture because of this. And this one would be good for solar because of that. Just giving us ideas so that later we can come up with a feasibility study for these and attract investors. Um, so, and then the next is just planning and funding these projects. Um, we have about 50 grants that we've been able to find as potential opportunities, and we've already been able to apply for eight of the technical assistance ones, so we're still waiting for feedback on some of those, but just being able to know what's out there has been really helpful. Next slide. Okay, so our future plans. Um, with the housing and residential infrastructure, here's that coal asset map, and it's been so helpful because you can like click on it and it's with Google, and so you can like see where these places are, and so we'll be able to use this to help attract investors. Um, but really the next thing we're gonna need is some feasibility studies to be able to show like, here's some slip sheets on what these little sites are and, and whatever people are interested in. Okay, the next one. Um, and then the local business development. There is a town called Wayland, Kentucky, and it is just like three or 400 people. It's this historic coal camp. It is so adorable, and it has this like sports history. They're really trying to like leverage their assets for this and create like a sports museum because they had the first Kentucky Mr. Basketball there. They got so many good ideas, and we just couldn't get it moving forward. So the Just Transition Fund helped us to get some conceptual designs, and so that's what we've been moving forward with, with some of these grants. It's been wonderful. Thank you. And then the next one. Um, with workforce development, so this is really innovative. So we've been working with the Metals Innovation Initiative, um, and they are basically started about two years ago. They had a bunch of metals companies get together and say, we want more innovation, we want to collaborate, we want to work together. And so we're working with them to figure out how can we bring some of these jobs that they're having trouble filling to the rural areas of Kentucky. So we're one of four different counties in Kentucky, two in the western coal fields and two in the eastern coal fields, where we're working with the Metals Innovation Initiative to do a matching process to find out what are some of the jobs that could be done from not so far away so we could start some satellite offices and then specifically have workforce training programs for our people for those jobs. All right, next slide. Okay, thank you so much. I hope you come and visit. I'd love to show you around. Um, there's my information right there. Appreciate you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel Young. I'm the Deputy Director of Partnerships with the Just Transition Fund. Um, really pleased to be here this afternoon to speak with you about our role in this um, Just Transition ecosystem. And I think you're already hearing from, from Ruthie and Grace about some of the ways in which um, the services we offer are, are really complementary. Um, next slide, please. So for those of you who don't know us, our mission is to create economic opportunity for the workers and communities hit hardest by coal's decline. And we work to strengthen and diversify the economies of hard hit coal communities from the bottom up. We launched in 2015 during the Obama administration in response to the creation of power, which was, as everyone in this room knows, um, the first time that federal funding was made available uh, specifically for coal communities in economic transition. 
And so our co-founders, Heidi Binko and Sandra Mikesh, really knew that these communities face so many barriers to actually accessing these dollars and that targeted investment by philanthropy was really needed to ensure that the investment flowed to the people in the places who really needed it the most. Uh, so that was the moment we were launched in, and it's of course very relevant to the moment that we're in today, as we've been discussing. Um, we've now been in this work for nearly a decade, um, across three administrations and, and soon to be four. Uh, next slide, please. So a word about our, our approach and framework. We really believe in place-based economic development strategies that support local entrepreneurs and build on community assets to create equitable and inclusive economic opportunity. Uh, so we have a framework for economic transition, which is threefold. So first, we promote economic diversification across a range of sectors based on the assets of the place and the community's vision for its economic future. Uh, we support projects that create good jobs, build local wealth, and strengthen local economies. We also support the expansion of workforce development programs uh, that connect workers with, with good jobs in these growing sectors. And finally, we help to improve infrastructure um, that is really critical for economic development with a real focus on, on broadband. Uh, next slide, please. We work to achieve our mission through three core strategies. Uh, we like things in threes, so access, advocate, convene. Uh, I will primarily focus on our work to access federal dollars um, and our work to help communities overcome the barriers that exist to doing that. Um, we also help to advance state and federal transition policy and we convene transition stakeholders to facilitate the, the spread of good ideas. Um, but before I get to our access work, I'd like to say a word about, about our policy work just as, as helpful context, I think. So next slide, please. And Tom Corman's alluded to some of this work in his remarks earlier today, but um, five years ago, uh, we launched something called our National Economic Transition Initiative, and at that time, there was a, a real need uh, for a coordinated response from the federal government to the economic distress affecting coal communities. And so this initiative brought together a planning team of leaders, coal community leaders from all across the country. Um, many of those groups are, are in the room today. Uh, I know Milton Association is here, Appalachian Voices, Coalfield. Uh, many others, and we worked together for over a year to develop the National Economic Transition Platform um, and the seven policy pillars that you see um, on the slide. We uh, released the platform in 2020, made a set of actionable recommendations to federal policymakers. Um, next slide, please. And I won't walk through this, but um, with the planning team, we, we really raised our collective voice to advocate for this platform, and many of the recomm uh, those recommendations were reflected uh, both in the historic funding from Congress and in um, very important major executive action, such as the creation of the IWG. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that, of course, brings us to uh, the moment of opportunity we're in today and the, and the reason we're all here, um, driving federal investment into coal communities. And so uh, for the past few years, we've really gone uh, back to our roots and been very focused on ensuring that um, the distressed coal communities that we serve are able to really take full advantage of this historic opportunity. Um, so to quote Heidi, our, our CEO, she often says that just because, because the money is there, it doesn't mean that communities can access it. And I know everyone in this room is very familiar with those barriers. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, in 2021, we launched our Federal Access Center, which uh, really expanded and just kind of gave a, gave a label to the work that we had been doing since our founding to help communities access federal funding. We know that communities are at different stages in their respective economic transitions, and they're also at, at very different places when it comes to readiness to apply. So uh, we designed the Federal Access Center with the intent of, of really meeting communities where they are. And so to that end, to get into the nuts and bolts a little bit, um, we. We offer support through our Federal Access Center at two stages. So first, we offer uh, what we call application-ready support, and so that consists of uh, a few things. First, flexible grants to cover uh, the many costs associated with developing competitive applications. So it includes match, uh, which, as we've been talking about, um, is, is just such a critical need, as well as funding for uh, for grant writers is, is probably the, the second biggest um, need that we we respond to, um, but those grants also cover um, staff capacity, technical studies, cost to convene partners, just you name it, um, whatever whatever the cost is. Um, 
we also provide uh, direct technical assistance to, to help um, navigate, navigate the federal bureaucracy, <laughs> identify those programs that, that are the best fit. Um, we provide grant writing and review of applications before submission. And we make these awards on a, a rolling rapid response basis. These are, um, it, it's a very streamlined process and we make decisions in a matter of, of weeks, not months. You know, these federal deadlines, you know, are come, come and go, um, and so quick, quick uh, decision making is really critical. Um, and we know that this is really long term, term work and that it takes, you know, so many years of, of planning and project development and, yes, say it with me, capacity building to be ready to apply for federal funding and manage a federal grant. And so we also uh, work to help um, build the pipeline through our early stage support. Uh, we launched last year uh, what we call our Coal Communities Get Ready Challenge, which is providing grants and customized technical assistance to help communities uh, develop their big, bold ideas uh, to transform their, their local economies. And we'll be very excited to soon announce, publicly announce, our inaugural cohort of a dozen projects across the country. Uh, some of them are in this room, so very excited to make that public announcement very soon. And we also expect to launch another round uh, later this year, so stay tuned. And if you're interested in either our application ready or our early stage support, um, please, please reach out, please come talk to me. Um, our eligible uh, entities that we support are um, nonprofit organizations, local governments, and tribal governments. And then last but not least, uh, we partner with federal agencies to ensure that our work is as well coordinated as, as it can be and that we're um, best able to support our local partners. Um, so this, of course, includes our ongoing work with the IWG and um, some of the rapid response teams. Uh, we also recently launched a very exciting partnership with the Department of Energy, Office of Indian Policy and Programs to help tribal uh, coal communities access federal funding. That agency has signed uh, MOU so far with the Navajo and Hopi Nations and uh, through our partnership with the agency, uh, our team, we have team members working on the ground to help provide capacity and, and write federal federal applications. Uh, next slide, please. There are so many exciting examples of uh, wins that we've been a part of, and so these are just a few, mostly pretty recent ones that I'm really excited to, um, to lift up. We are currently supporting um, five of the uh, 22 finalists um, uh, in their pending applications to phase two of EDA Recompete. We're excited for that announcement coming very soon. I know. Uh, Colby Hall from SOAR is, of course, here, so um, our fingers are very tightly crossed. Um, we supported two winners of the inaugural NSF uh, National Science Foundation Regional Innovations Program, um, Regional Innovation Engines Program, and these groups are uh, receiving $160 million each uh, over 10 years. Uh, there's a project called the Great Lakes Water Innovation Engine um, in that region. Focused, It's a bl uh, blue economy initiative that was focused on wastewater recovery. Um, and workforce development, and then North Carolina, there's a textile innovation and sustainability engine focused on uh, growing the environmentally sustainable textile industry. So very cool projects, very excited to um, support those wins. Uh, Native Renewables, uh, another longtime partner of ours, um, recently received $8 million from the DOE's Energy Improvements in Rural or Remote Areas Program for a very cool project uh, to install off-grid solar to electrify rural homes on Navajo Nation, uh, while also training and employing an indigenous workforce. Um, we also very proudly supporting, uh, supported applications for uh, a couple of Build Back Better awards um, a couple of years ago now, and we heard from leaders of those projects yesterday, so also really excited to, to shout out, of course, the Act Now Coalition, which received $63 million. Um, and we've supported uh, Coalfield as well as the, the West Virginia Hub and um, Generation West Virginia. So I'm very excited, of course, about that. And we also provided match to um, the UMWA Career Centers to help unlock $3 million of uh, a larger Build Back Better award that they were part of uh, for the program that uh, Columbia spoke about yesterday to train workers in the robotics industry. So could go on and on and on. It's been it's so exciting and so many sort of pending uh, victories in the, in the pipeline. But to give a few examples, um, next slide, please. And I'll, I'll end here. We have to date helped the coal communities. Uh, we serve leverage about $1.9 million to support economic development. Of course, you know, it is not just about the dollars, but about the long-term capacity 
uh, that we're really uh, helping to build to ensure that these dollars also real, lead to real change, uh, real economic impact on the ground. Um, we have to date reached over half of coal communities across the country, 55%. And in this very critical moment, we're working to both uh, really expand and deepen the impact of our work. And we can only do that in partnership with all of you. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you all very much. Are there any, any questions for our, our illustrious team here? I've got, I've got one to kick it off. How do we replicate? How do we scale? How do we take these great success stories and, and put them all over the country? Any ideas? Well, I, th I think it's meetings like this. I mean, it's so critical to have spaces just like this where we can share those successes and those lessons learned and make connections. And so, um, and it also echoes a comment that you made, Ruthie, about the need to, to really convene. I think that's so critical and, I mean, part of the solution, but I think it's really critical. So really glad this event is happening. Well, and Grace, please take, take that one with the community of practice. And Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, BREC is designed on the idea of a community of practice, and we've built a national network that I mentioned, and it has over a thousand coal community stakeholders in it right now. So there's a lot of buy-in from the local level. There's a lot of knowledge. You all are the experts in this space. And so when, a lot of times when we have these convenings, we're hearing from the feds, but we also create a space where the localities can share how they are leveraging these resources. Um, and so through the BREC National Network, we have our webinars that we try to feature localities frequently. Um, to you know, really highlight those replicable projects, um, and we also have an online community platform where those are shared. Um, but definitely, the the community of practice model and really embracing that. And um, I think that this group here probably it's preaching to the choir a little bit. You you're here because you know the value of hearing what other localities are up to, um, and so just really, you know, it's it's a lot of time that's been here, but I think that, you know, I'm feeling like there's a lot of payoff on my end, and I'm sure that everybody here is too. Anything from the room or the floor? Hey, Jacob, or? <clears throat> Hello, Simon DeFoy, I'm from Pueblo, Colorado. Um, I, this is our first time here as a Pueblo Economic Development Corporation as a recipient. Um, so we're grateful to be here and learn. Um, but I'm starting to see that and have seen that energy community is defined differently in every different um, agency and application. And in some instances, we're not qualified. In others, we may be. Can you talk a little bit about how you all have navigated that space and if there's a way to help E more easily identify what you may be eligible for for give any given community who's in their unique situation. Yeah, um, like in Floyd County, we've been really successful just with like the energy uh, community's website. They have some really good uh, fun like a funding database there. And there's actually Kim Varzi is the navigator. I'm not sure where she is. Um, but she's amazing, and if you can connect with her, then she can also, if you can tell her your projects, she could also potentially help. Also, Just Transition Fund, um, they have consultants as well who can sometimes help you find um, different, different programs that can help. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of resources out there. I know grants.gov isn't necessarily the easiest to navigate, <laughs> but um, also for energy, res uh, energy funding, there is uh, something called Empower Innovation, if you go to Empower Innovation, I guess .com, I'm not sure, they have lots of great funding opportunities, and you can sign up for a newsletter. Most of that is energy related. And Rural Lisk, Rural Lisk is great to find opportunities as well. They have a newsletter. My question's somewhat related. So Gail, you did an amazing job describing your four buckets of capacity building. Love that. You all really laid out very tangible means to put that capacity directly within communities' hands. Awesome. Uh, I'm spoiled because I, I, you know, Gail, I have access to your funding because I'm in Appalachia, but for partners here that are maybe in Wyoming or Montana, that's a resource that maybe isn't as eligible. 
And so thinking about your impact too, I'd love for there to be more of this throughout the region and the other agencies. So just from a gut check, uh, I'm not asking for like a specific number, how many uh, organizations or communities do you think you're able to serve with your programs versus how many are not able to reach those resources? And not out of like a failing of your program, but just maybe aren't aware or not able to reach it or there's just limited access or limited funding to, to go around because it would be awesome to see more agencies take on what, what uh, ARC is doing with their four buckets of capacity building to take on what you are doing with your capacity building. So I'm just curious how much you're able to support versus how much is not getting supported because there's limited funding. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not sure I can attach a specific number to it. I mean, as I said, we've worked in 55% um, of coal communities to date. We've done an analysis to look at which are the most distressed because not all are, of course, equally impacted. Um, we probably are supporting upwards of 75 to 80 different projects this year. Um, and I think we could easily double that, um, you know, if we were to both, as I was saying, both expand in communities where we haven't um, yet been able to work. And also there's more to do in all the places where we're currently working as well. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, uh, definitely a lot more um, resources are needed and capacity is, is, is needed and I think could be easily absorbed by the by the communities uh, that we serve easily and and so I, I want to I want to thank you all um, both for your, your leadership your organization's leadership your inspiration uh, locally and and nationally and so and, and for sharing your stories today again I think we'll have some some opportunity as we as we go convening um, afterwards, but uh, let, let's give our panel a, a great round of applause.